Hello again and welcome back to English Today. This is DVD 14 and the second DVD of your upper intermediate level. And in this DVD, we'll begin with another two episodes of our story, That's Life, and then our special TV programs. Our cinema expert will be talking about the film Casablanca. And then in our travel section, we'll be talking about ethical travel. Then, in the grammar section, we'll learn more about phrasal verbs, those difficult verbs followed by prepositions. We'll also study the second conditional, and we'll look at some useful language for socializing, okay? So have fun. Really? Peter was going to punch Jack? That's right. But luckily, I arrived in time. I'm glad I decided to check up on them. Wow. What happened next? Well, Jack and I left, and I think Peter and Sharon carried on with their argument. Oh, wow. Oh, it's a shame I wasn't there. But you knew about Jack and Sharon, didn't you? Well, yes. I found out by chance. I came across a photo of them together while I was cleaning one day. Wow! What an incredible story. Could you stop saying wow? This isn't a film. If it were a film, there would be a happy ending. Well, to tell you the truth, I think this is more exciting than The Bold and the Beautiful. What's going to happen now? I have no idea. If Sharon doesn't go to Japan, I think she and Jack will probably get back together. And how are you getting on? If I were you, I would forget Jack. Oh, don't worry about me. I'll get over him. Good girl. If I were you, I would look after myself. There are other fish in the sea, <laughs> and you are such a great catch. Thank you, Alice. But to tell you the truth, I'm looking forward to not having a man in my life for a while. Don't say that. I know you're hurt, but what would you do if you met a nice, handsome young man who, by the way, Loved cleaning as much as you do. Well, if he... If he loved cleaning as much as I do, I wouldn't let him go. But, you know, men like that are pretty rare. Anyway, getting back to Jack and Sharon, how do you think it will end? Don't worry about that. I'll send you a letter with all the details. And I'm going to miss you, you know. Me too. But I'm happy that you're going to work with your father. Oh, it's great that he wants you to come up with the stories for his films. It's what you really wanted, after all. It's true. It's been such a long time since I got on so well with him. And of course, I can't wait to get on with the new film. I'm so excited about it all. Another star in the family. Miss Dubois conquers Hollywood. Actors and actresses doing their best to impress her. No one can keep up with her. Especially because Mars is in line with Scorpio. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to do now, Anne? Oh, well, the first thing I'll do is look for a new flatmate so I can carry on living in this apartment. You know how expensive it is. Mm. If I had the money, I would live here on my own. But you're not alone. There's Jack. <laughs> and how long do you think he'll stay here? As soon as Peter leaves, he'll, he'll only be looking after Sharon and, and her apartment. <laughs>
Hello again and welcome back for another lesson in your live TV program of English language. I want to look more closely at the dialogue that they just had because they are using some very interesting verse called phrasal verbs. Now a phrasal verb, let me give you an example. I'm glad I decided to check up on them. Now, this is a verb with some prepositions. What happens is the verb itself changes its meaning and it's actually sometimes very difficult to guess what it means. So when a verb has a preposition or even two prepositions after it and it changes its meaning, its original meaning, we call it in English a phrasal verb. So what I want to do with you now is to use the board and also the examples that there were in the dialogue and we'll see that there are two groups, in fact the screen will be divided into two groups. One will be two word phrasal verbs and the other is three word phrasal verbs. Let me explain a little bit better. For example, Anne said, the example before, I'm glad I decided to check up on them. You see that? To check up on them. Check with two prepositions. Now, this verb, to check up on them, means to look at something more closely, to examine something more in depth. All right, so that is the new meaning. Anne then said, I think Peter and Sharon carried on with their argument. Now, carry usually means this. You know, you pick something up and you carry it. If you add prepositions, so the example here is to carry on, it changes meaning and carry on here means to continue. So I think Peter and Sharon carried on with their argument means to continue their argument. All right, so let's carry on. Then Anne said, I found out by chance, found out, that becomes the meaning of discover. I discovered something. Okay, so find out. Next one. She said, I came across a photo. Now, came across. Very difficult to understand what that means. Because in this context, to come across, it means to find something or to find someone by chance. She says, I came across a photo of them together while I was cleaning one day. Okay, you see, they're not easy, quite complicated. Anne then said, I think she and Jack will get back together. So, look at that. That is a three-word phrasal verb. There are two prepositions, to get back together, and that means to become a couple again. Okay, to reconcile, get back together. Then Anne said, oh, don't worry, I'll get over him. Interesting, impossible to guess the meaning. Get over means to forget about. I'll get over him means I'll forget him, all right? Alice says, if I were you, I would look after myself. Look at that one. Look after, again, difficult to imagine. It means to take care of, take care of yourself. So if I were you, I would look after myself. Good. Next one. There are two more. It's been a long time since I got on so well. Now, to get on with means to have smooth relations with a person. It means that the relationship is going well without problems to get on with. And the last one. Anne says, I'm looking forward to not having a man in my life. Again, look at that. To look forward 
to. Again, very interesting. This has two prepositions, look forward to. And it means that you think of an event in the future with pleasure. I could say to you, I look forward to seeing you again in the next lesson. All right, so these are the phrasal verbs, very difficult. People hate them. And they say, well, why don't you use easier verbs in English? Well, they come from Anglo-Saxon. And because we use them very often, I'm afraid you have to get familiar with them. All right. So we'll keep practicing. And I'll see you again. I look forward to seeing you again in the next lesson. OK, bye. Hi, Sharon. Could I speak to you for a moment? Sure, Peter. I'm listening. You know, I thought a lot about what you told me. Well, I have to admit you're right. I haven't been paying very much attention to you. I won't be angry if you don't want to stay with me. Oh, Peter, don't worry about me. Just look forward to your musical. It's your big break, isn't it? If you weren't so committed, you wouldn't be the man for the job now, would you? You're a star, right? Yes, I know. It just isn't easy imagining Japan without you. It won't be easy for me either. But I'm sure it's the right decision for both of us. I hope so. If I were rich and famous already, I'd send along my private jet so you could visit me on weekends. Yeah, right. The petrol alone would cost you your fortune. <laughs> Who cares? I'd be rich. So, while I wait for you to bring your career off and become rich, I might come visit you. Maybe with Anne. But if you're famous, you'll forget all about me. You'd let it go to your head and wouldn't have time to take care of me. I couldn't keep up with all those beautiful young actresses. How could I forget you, Sharon? By the way, would you mind me taking that beautiful photo of you along with to Japan with me, the one hanging in the living room. It'll help me when I'm missing you, especially in the beginning. Of course, Peter. Take it. I'll be happy to give it to you. Thank you. Well, I have to get on with packing. One last thing. If we were to meet in a few years, in two apartments close to each other, you with your new boyfriend, would you pretend not to know me like you did with Jack? Why do you ask me that? Oh, I don't know. Just curious. I guess it would be fun to meet you somewhere else and have a little secret between us two. Hello again and welcome back for some more English. Did you hear Peter say to Sharon, if I were rich and famous, I would send along my private jet so she could visit him at weekends. If I were rich and famous, I would send along my private jet. Well, that's a bit improbable, isn't it? But it's useful for us because it means that we can learn another grammatical form because he was using the second conditional. Remember in another lesson we learned 
the first conditional. This one is the second conditional. So if I were rich and famous, I'd send along. Now, this is unusual because you say to yourself, wait a minute, if I were, that's not right. Because I taught you, I was, you were, he, she, it was, we were, you were, they were. How can you say if I were? Well, it's a special grammatical form. It's a subjunctive form, probably the only subjunctive form left in English. And when you say, if I were you, you're putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Okay? He says, if I were rich and famous, uses the verb to be. And this is where the subjunctive comes into play. All right? So very unusual. You must have probably heard this expression, if I were you. If I were you, I would do this. And I want to give you some examples of that because it's very common in English. If I say to you, for example, I'm tired. You could answer, if I were you, I'd go to bed. Now, if I were you, that's the past form, followed by I would go to bed. That's the conditional form, conditional two. If I were you, I would go to bed. Um, another example, smoking. Yeah, I say, look, I can't stop smoking. I'm, I want to stop smoking, but I can't. You could say to me, well, if I were you, I'd, I would, I'd go to a hypnotist, for example. One possibility, why not? If I were you, I would. Another example, imagine that I am bitten. Look, Mr. Snake bites me. I've been bitten by a snake. I've been bitten by a snake. You could say to me, well, if I were you, I would suck your blood out. Or if I were you, I would go immediately to a doctor. So do you see how this works? If I were you, I would. Let's go to the screen now because I want to show you that example and also normal examples of the second conditional. So, we use the second condition when, when something is improbable. That's why we use if. Let's look at some normal examples. We have if plus the simple plast and then would and the infinitive. So, a typical example is if I won the lottery, win one one, I'd buy a house. Yeah. If I won the lottery, I'd buy a house. I would buy a house. It's improbable, but if he didn't smoke, negative, past, negative, he wouldn't need an operation. You see, if plus the simple past in the negative and then would in the negative. If you ate less, you would lose more weight. If you ate less, you'd lose more weight. All right, so those are normal examples of the hypothetical situations of the second conditional. And now let's get back to the example I did with you. If I were rich and famous, remember that? If I were. In the episode, it was if he were rich and famous, he'd send an airplane to Sharon, okay? If I were you, I would forget Jack. If I were you, I would forget Jack. If I were you, I would continue studying with me and English today if I were you. 
All right, so that's the second conditional for you. There are three. We've studied number one, we've studied number two, and later on we'll see number three too. Okay? So, goodbye for now. Bye. So it's just you and me, isn't it, Anne? Well, really, it's just me, all alone. Are you still angry? <laughs> no, I was just joking. Of course, it'll be difficult to forget a man like you. <laughs> You're just pulling my leg now, aren't you, Anne? I wanted to say, if it had been a, a different time in my life, or if there weren't Sharon, maybe we would, or rather, maybe we could. Too many ifs, Jack. Anyway. I'm happy for both you and Sharon. Really. You know, I adore love stories with happy endings. <laughs> hey, don't jump to conclusions. Sharon just left Peter. Okay. <laughs> Let things take their natural course. You know, as Alice would say, if, if she were here. I really miss her craziness. <laughs> and her jokes. Mm. The house just isn't the same without her. That's true. She always had something to say. I... I miss so many things. Like Peter. <laughs> I even miss his singing exercises. <laughs> but they were awful. Our poor ears. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But I was used to them. Oh, by the way, how did things turn out in the end between you two? Pretty well. I, well, we, we had a long talk, and he understood it really wasn't my fault, uh, that it was inevitable. Well, Peter was just too involved with his career to notice Sharon's needs and desires. But let's just say I took advantage of their situation. <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> You've never missed a chance like that in your life, have you? That's late. I have to go. I'm late as usual. Oh, by the way, Sharon and I are going to see a film tonight. Would you like to come? Thanks for the invitation, Jack. Um, but uh, I'd prefer to stay home. Anyway, a possible new flatmate is coming to take a look at the apartment. And... Well, his name's Nick. Well, actually, I've, I've got to get things tidied up. That's right. Cleanliness is next to godliness, huh? Don't work too hard, Anne. Perhaps Nick is less tidy than Alice and I put together. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> I lost the battle with you two, but it's time to put an end to all this chaos. I'll ask him all the right questions, and but if I get the feeling he doesn't like cleaning, I won't let him in the door.
Hello again, everyone. Jack exits and Nick enters. Maybe. We'll see. Now, I have a quiz for you. You've learned a lot of language up until now, and I want to see how much you remember of what you've learned. The quiz is this. I will say something which is wrong, and you, with all your grammar knowledge, must correct it. Let me give you an example. I say, when have you gone? Now that's wrong because when uses the simple past. So we correct it and say, when did you go? All right, so that's the quiz. Your turn. What means this word? What means this word? Yeah. That's a question. With questions you need, yeah, auxiliaries. So, what means this word? What does this word mean? Yes. Next one. Has he any brothers? Question. Good. It's a question auxiliary. Does he have any brothers? Okay. Next one. This is more difficult. Be careful. I live here since 1977. I live here since 1977. Think of since. Since. Yeah. Present perfect continuous. I have been living here since 1977. Great. Next one. What do you do tomorrow? What do you do tomorrow? Yeah, exactly. Do you do is the present tense. Tomorrow is the future. So, what are you doing tomorrow? Or what are you going to do tomorrow? Futures. Right. Next one. They haven't to work on Sundays. They haven't to work on Sundays. Negative. Wrong. Present tense, the auxiliary, exactly. They don't have to work on Sundays. Great. Next one. Do she play tennis? Do she play tennis? Mm, terrible. Yeah. Exactly. Third person. So, does she play tennis? Excuse me. Next one. I call you later. I call you later. Think of this. snap decision. So it becomes exactly, I'll call you, I'll call you later. Great. Next one. He just left. He just left. Okay, we have just. With just, we use genie, just, never, already, never, yet. Present, perfect, so, yeah. He has just left. He has just left. Great. This one here. If I would know, I would tell you. If I would know, I would tell you. Not possible. Second conditional. If I knew, fantastic, I would tell you. And the last one. How much it cost. This is a typical mistake. How much it cost? It's a question. You need an auxiliary. So that's it. How much does it cost? Fantastic. You're great. Great students. Keep on studying like this and you'll be able to speak English like me at the end of the course. All right? Great. Well, take care. Keep studying. See you in the next lesson. Okay. Bye. Good evening. My name's Nick. How do you do? How do you do, Nick? My name's Anne. It's a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure's all mine. So this is the apartment. It's very beautiful. And so clean and tidy. I love cleanliness. 
I'd even say that I'm a maniac for cleaning. Really? Well, yes. My friends give me a hard time. They say that I'm the mommy of the group. Oh, <laughs> is that so? My friends say the same thing about me. <laughs> well, there's another thing, Anne. To tell you the truth, it's a little embarrassing. I have another hobby which I adore. What would that be? Well, I just adore cooking. In fact, could I take a look at the kitchen? Are you okay, Anne? What? The kitchen. Do you think you could show me the kitchen? Oh, um, I'm sorry. It's just that, well, I love cooking. Fantastic. That way we can experiment and try out new dishes together, okay? So, where is it? Right. Um, the kitchen is in there. Great. Roomy, well lit, and tidy, just as I like it. I've got to confess that the kitchen is key to whether I come to live here or not. Oh, um, well, Nick, are you pleased? I mean, with the apartment. Oh, yes. It's very lovely. I like it very much. Not only the apartment. Thank you. Um, so, when would you like to move in? Well, if it's all right, I'll move in tonight. I just need some time to get my things. Oh, that's great. Well, I'll cook up some dinner while you get your things, and then you can tell me what you think. I'm sure I'm not as good a cook as you. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I'll go get my things. I'll try to hurry up, and then I can give you a hand. You know what, Anne? I think we're going to get along well. So, Anne and Nick cleaned happily ever after. Now, in the last episodes, we have seen lives changing. We've seen people saying goodbye. And I want to look at that language that we use when we say farewell. Farewell, in English, is a word which means stay well in the future. So let's look at some of the language we can use. We heard, I'm sorry to see you go, and also, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you. Hope to see you again soon is something we very often use. Hope to see you again soon, okay? Call me from time to time. Call me from time to time is a nice one. Another really nice expression in English is let's keep in touch. Let's keep in touch. All right, so that you continue having a contact with that person. Let's keep in touch. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know how you're doing, okay? Then saying goodbye to people, some examples are all the best. All the best for your new job, for example, to Peter. Good luck with your new job. Another very common expression, good luck with your new job. See you soon. See you soon. Yes, yeah, like an imperative there. Take care. That's really very nice. It means look after yourself. Look after yourself or take care. Then safe journey. Now that's when people are leaving by car or by plane or by train. Safe journey and you're wishing that they have no problems. Then, goodbye, 
or more informally by cheers, which is something that we use a lot in England, and we also use it when you're drinking with someone, cheers, also for goodbye, cheers. And we also use the Italian form ciao. So, bye, cheers, and ciao until our next lesson, where we'll be doing some more English language. Ciao. Hello, hello. I'm Lucy Ross, and this is Talk Cinema. And today, with our cinema expert, Sanjeev Gupta, we pay homage to one of the most popular films of all time, an unforgettable Hollywood masterpiece. I don't think I need say more. I'm sure you all know the film we're going to talk about today, Casablanca. Casablanca. The amazing cast, the fantastic script, and of course, the unforgettable story. Yes, there'll always be a place in my heart for Casablanca. And not only in your heart, Sanjeev. Well, let's try to explain to our viewers why this film is so popular. First of all, there are the performances of two of Hollywood's greatest actors, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. And secondly, it's a film that was able to bring romance together with the serious theme of resistance to the Nazis. The end result is a passionate love story brimming over with emotion. Yes, you just can't forget the wonderful performances of Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. Could you run through the plot for us, Sanjeev, just to jog our viewers' memories? Sure. Casablanca takes us back to a wartime Europe of Nazis and freedom fighters. The film, directed by Michael Curtis in 1942, focuses on the character of Rick Blaine, a cynical American who has escaped from occupied France to open an upmarket jazz bar in the Moroccan city of Casablanca. He has to choose between his love for Ilsa and his duty to help her husband, Laszlo, a resistance leader, to escape from Morocco to continue his fight against the Nazis. Ilsa first met and fell in love with Rick in Paris. She believed her husband had been killed by the Nazis. When she discovers that Laszlo is still alive, she leaves Rick abruptly without explanation and returns to Laszlo, leaving Rick feeling betrayed and bitter. In the end, Rick sacrifices his love and helps Laszlo and Ilsa to escape to Lisbon. Wow, that's it. Yes, who can forget Rick's famous line to Ilsa as she gets on the plane at the end of the film. We'll always have Paris. That's true. There are also several other famous lines in the film. For example, when Rick says to Ilsa, here's looking at you, kid. Or when Ilsa says to Sam, the piano player, Play it, Sam. Play. Uh, wait a minute. What's the name of that song? Oh, yes. I remember. As time goes by, I've sung it so many times. But tell us, am I correct in thinking the film won an Oscar? Three Oscars for Best Picture, Best Director and Best Screenplay. It was a big hit in 1942 and has been ever since. Casablanca represents Hollywood at its best a film with undying universal appeal. The film is still shown regularly in America. Really? Do you mean on TV or in the cinema? Both, actually. You know, colleges across the USA show the film every year during the week of graduation exams. This has helped keep the film popular. Well, it certainly is an unforgettable film. That's Casablanca. Thanks to our expert, Sanjeev. Goodbye, Lucy. Goodbye. And goodbye, everyone. See you again soon with the next edition of Talk Cinema. So, have you seen Casablanca? It really is an unforgettable masterpiece. We say something is unforgettable when it's difficult to forget. Casablanca is unforgettable because it's such a good film. We call it a masterpiece. A masterpiece is an excellent piece of work. 
We usually use it for films, books and art. Why is Casablanca such an unforgettable film? First of all, the amazing cast. Amazing here means incredible, very good. The cast is all the actors of a film. Casablanca features Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. If you've seen it, you can't forget their incredible performances. An actor's performance is the way the actor plays his or her role. Secondly, the script. The script is the text of a film or a play. In fact, Casablanca won three Oscars, one for the best screenplay. The screenplay is another word for the script. It won best director. The director was Michael Curtis. We say it was directed by Michael Curtis and it won best picture. Best picture means best film. I'll quickly run through the plot to jog your memories. What does all that mean? To run through something means to make a brief summary. The plot is the storyline, what happens in the film. And to jog someone's memory means to help them remember. Sanjeev jogged my memory. He made me remember some famous lines from the film. A line is something an actor says in the film. One of the most famous lines is, at the end of the film, we'll always have Paris. Notice how we say, at the end of something, but in the end means finally, after some time. And now it's time for me to say goodbye. So see you all next time. Bye. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of The Travel Programme. In the studio with me, as always, is Christine Oteng, our travel expert. Good morning, Lucy, and hello to everyone. Are you dreaming of your next holiday? You can't wait to get away from it all. Thinking of going to an exotic, tropical destination? Well, let's have a look at some suggestions that will make your travels more rewarding and help local people too. So, over to you, Christine. Thanks, Lucy. Well, the golden rule for a true traveller is to respect the culture and environment of the country you're visiting. This is why I want to talk today about ethical travel. I'm not talking here about a weekend in Paris or a week on a Greek island, but more about tourism to more distant locations in poor, developing countries. Ethical travel is all about what to do when you're on holiday in one of these countries. Can you give an example? Sure. To start with, before you leave home, try to choose a travel company that gives part of its profits to a fund that supports local community projects. You know, with traditional tourism, only a very small percentage of the income generated by visitors actually goes to local people. Most of the money that tourists spend goes to multinational companies. Usually, these companies take their profits out of the country and do very little to help local communities and the local environment. You're right. The tourist industry can be a very cutthroat business. So, do you have any other suggestions on how we can travel ethically? Sure. Choose a resort that is built with local materials in the local style or stay in local family-run hotels. Shop and eat where local people do. Use public transport and try to learn a few words of the language before you leave home. The only way to really get to know a country is to get in touch with local people. So it can be useful to read up on the place you're going to visit and its culture before you leave home. Of course, tourists usually see the local culture as something colourful and exotic without really understanding it very well. It's important, though, to learn about local traditions and to respect them. Do this and your holiday will be much more rewarding experience. One more thing, do remember to always ask before taking photos. And what about shopping? Is this against the concept of ethical travel? 
Absolutely not. Shopping's always fun, but do use your head when shopping. I mean, try to buy souvenirs from local markets and always pay a fair price for goods. Bargaining's fine, but don't beat the locals down too much. One important thing, never buy souvenirs made from endangered species. This is illegal and damages the local ecosystem. Fine, so an ethical traveller is a responsible tourist who knows how to combine the joys of travelling with a respect for the local culture and environment. Any more advice for us, Christine? Yes, just one last thing. Follow these suggestions and your travels will be a lot more rewarding and much more fun. I'm sure they will be. Well, thanks, Christine, for your really useful tips on how to be an ethical traveller. Well, that's all we have time for today, so goodbye, Christine. Goodbye to all travellers, and remember, travel ethically and enjoy your holidays more. See you soon with another edition of The Travel Programme. Goodbye. Well, I can't wait to get away from it all. I can't wait is an expression that means you're looking forward to something. To get away from it all means to have a holiday and leave your daily life behind. Today, Christine gave us some tips on how to be an ethical traveller. A tip is a piece of advice, a suggestion. First of all, what is ethical travel? It's travel that respects the local culture and environment. Local means from a specific place. For example, the local people are the people that live in a place, and the local culture is the culture from that place. The environment is the world that surrounds us, all the social, physical and cultural conditions of a place. Christine gave us a golden rule, a rule that should not be broken. The golden rule for an ethical traveller is in fact to respect the local culture and environment. She also suggested choosing a travel company that gives some of its profit to local communities. A community is a group of people living in the same area. A travel company is a company that organises tours to various parts of the world. And you should read up on the place you want to visit. To read up on something means to research and get information about something. The best place to stay is in a family-run hotel. Family-run means it's owned and managed by a family. And when you go shopping in a market, bargaining is okay. To bargain means to decide the price with the seller. If something costs $20, you bargain to pay $15. But don't beat the locals down too much. To beat someone down means to force them to reduce the price of something. That's all for this week. See you again soon.